Good evening. Oh, you guys are good. What a turnout we have tonight. It's really thrilling and gratifying to see so many people come out for this event back in person for public humanities events. I'm Jeremy Rosen. I'm the acting director of the Tanner Humanities Center. I'm an associate professor of English. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Tanner Lecture on Human Values with Heather McGee. I want to begin by acknowledging that the land we gather on today, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the university's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Established in 1976, the Tanner Lectures on Human Values are an international lecture series that reflect upon and advance educational and scientific discussions relating to human values. The University of Utah serves as the flagship institution for this series, and distinct Tanner Lectures are delivered annually at nine universities. The University of Utah, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Michigan, Stanford, University of California at Berkeley, Oxford, and Cambridge. And I, that's right. I have it on good authority that uh, this is the reason, and one of many reasons, in addition to a lot of the work people in this room are doing, that University of Utah is becoming known as the Cambridge of the uh, Mountain West, of the Mountain West. So the Tanner Lectures on Human Values are funded by an endowment and gifts received from Obert Clark Tanner and Grace Adams Tanner. The Tanner Humanities Center aims to advance humanities exploration and engagement through academic research, educational enrichment, and public outreach. This year marks the center's 35th anniversary. We're very excited to celebrate that, and we're grateful to Ober Clark, Ober Clark Tanner for his vision for the center and the Tanner Lectures and his commitment to philosophy and philanthropy. I also want to thank the late Can uh, Carolyn Tanner Irish, Stephen Tanner Irish, David Peterson, CEO of OC Tanner, and the Tanner family for their multi-generational commitment to the center and its work. We are also grateful for the Tanner Board of Trustees, including Mark Matheson and Beth James, who administer these lectures, and our Tanner Board, who helps us select our annual speaker. I also want to thank uh, Representative Sandra Hollins, who's in the room. I'm pleased to have her here. I'd also like to thank the King's English Bookshop. Um, they'll be outside selling books. Please buy a book. And Heather is generously going to sign books after this event outside in the lobby. I also need to thank the uh, Tanner Humanities Center staff, especially Beth James, Susan Anderson, and Missy Weeks, without whose tireless work none of these events would be possible. And the College of Humanities staff as well, and especially Dean Hollis Robbins, for their continued support of the center and its mission. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Marianne Villarreal, Vice President for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the University of Utah, to introduce Heather McGee. Thanks very much. Good evening, everyone. Don't you just feel giddy and full of love? Like you just want to say, wow. So let's just get it all out. Uh, uh, uh. Before I begin my introduction to Heather McGee, I've got to share this quick story with you. She's not going to remember this because it was virtual and she served with so many people. But in 2020, we served on a virtual panel for Kumu together with Bill Kavina, president of Cal State LA. I know Bill, nice guy, brilliant guy. But I kept thinking as we were going through, I'm trying to give mind telepath to the moderator, please don't let me go after Heather. Please don't let me go after Heather. <laughs> Go Heather Bell Marianne, Heather Bell Marianne, and uh, you know who wants to go after Heather? What? So what a joy and a privilege it is for me to be here tonight uh, to introduce to you our our dear guest, our brilliant guest, author, advocate, policy expert Heather McGee. Heather McGee is the author of the New York Times best-selling book, The Sum of Us: What Racism Costs Everyone and how we can prosper together, which is the winner of the 2022 Zocalo 
Zocalo a Public Square Book Prize and the 2021 Porchlight Prize. She is also the chair of the board of directors for the country's largest online racial justice organization, The Color of Change. And the former president, okay, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, wow. And the former president of the Public Policy and Multiracial Demo Democracy Think Tank, Demos. She's appeared on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, uh, Trevor Noah and on CNN, uh, C-SPAN, NPR, and is a regular panelist on Meet the Press and All In with Chris Hayes. McGee is an expert in economic public policy who has spoken widely on student debt crisis, the 2008 home loan crisis, and the way banking and lending laws have shaped the country and often deepened division and inequity. In her book, she tackles disparities in healthcare, infrastructure, labor, policy, education, and voting. And in each of these cases, McGee marshals the overwhelming evidence to demonstrate plainly and honestly the way racism, time and again, has drained the pool, doing enormous damage to all of us. And halfway through in her chapter discussing the history of segregation in schools, which we know that problem did not end with Brown versus Board of Education, she notes the profound harm done to white children by setting up financial and geographic systems that continue to promote white segregated schools. And we know all the consequences of what those, that segregation has done to our communities. But in her, in her book, McGee also shares with readers ample reason for hope. And her travels across the country, uh, in her interviews with people, what she has noted, and what we are all here, I hope, in our work at the University of Utah, in our work across divisions and in through community, is that when we do work together, right, that when we do work for communities of color, for our LGBT communities, when we do, country, do, we do work across all our communities, we do it for the sum of us, because it benefits all of us and makes us stronger, healthier, and better country. We are so privileged and lucky to have Heather McGee here with us this evening. I'd like to welcome you to the podium. Thank you. Well, that was um, my favorite introduction I've ever had. So thank you so much. Um, I'm really just honored to be here. Um, it's been a really warm reception so far, and that's saying a lot because it's 32 degrees. Um, and uh, yeah, I was, you know, I've been chatting with folks. There was a little reception beforehand, um, and people always ask, "Is this is this your first time to Utah?" You know, and um, I say no, actually. You know, I went to. Uh, law school in California and I'm from the Midwest and the East Coast and so I've actually driven cross country many times and I have been to um, Arches, I have been to Zion, I've been to Canyonlands and um, I have always said that Utah is the prettiest state in the country and so I'm very happy to be back here even though I've only seen you know my hotel room and the inside of this lovely building <laughs> since I've been here for the last uh, 18 hours. Um, but I'm really, really pleased to have this opportunity to do the Tanner Lecture. I do want to just uh, thank again, obviously, uh, the U and all of the Tanners and the Tanner uh, family and institution and corporation for, for having me here. Um, what's exciting to me about this evening um, is that I was told I have to uh, give a speech that I've not given before. And that's really kind of fun for me um, because most of the time I give my book talk, you know, and tonight I'm going to do something different. And so uh, you're in for a treat, more I'm in for a treat as I um, do something uh, that I haven't done before, which has been really great. So you all know that The Sum of Us is about what racism costs everyone. And um, if you've read the book or you've heard me speak about it or you just looked at the back flap, you understand that I am a person who came to this realization uh, at the, in the middle of a journey 
that I took, a literal as well as an intellectual journey, uh, across the country, from California to Mississippi to Maine and back again multiple times over the course of a number of years after I quit my job. I quit what was in many ways my dream job, running the nonprofit think tank that I had started working at as an entry level hire at the age of 22. I worked my way up to the top. I was running this organization. I was, as a young black woman, you know, at the table when a lot of economic policy decisions were being made. It was my dream in so many ways. And yet I decided to hand the reins over and leave that position really out of a sense of frustration and not quite despair, but something close to it. Because I felt that we had been working, I personally had been working, my organization had been working for the better part of 20 years using research and statistical analysis to try to bring evidence to bear on the biggest problems in the American economy, inequality, right? The fact that 1% of the population owned more wealth than the entire middle class while almost 50% of adult workers were paid too little to meet their basic needs for things like housing and food, right? And we weren't making enough headway. And it felt like it wasn't because our spreadsheets weren't accurate. It wasn't because our white papers weren't compelling. Well, they were very compelling. Um, it wasn't that our testimony wasn't sharp, right? Um, it, was, it wasn't that we didn't have the answers, in fact, right? There were pretty obvious public policy fixes that could really bring more people within sight of the American dream. And yet, what the problem was, was that we had these invisible headwinds that were holding us back from having the true majoritarian public will to do what was in our collective economic self-interest. And so when I hit the road in 2017, it was really to found, find out why why we can't seem to have nice things, right? And by nice things, I don't mean self-driving cars. I mean like really universal healthcare and paid family leave and childcare and affordable college and a great public school in every neighborhood and jobs that keep workers out of poverty and a rational response to climate change, right? I mean the nice things that a high functioning society should be able to do for themselves, right? And so that journey, took me on an intellectual and historical um, discovery of our nation's founding stories, of areas from healthcare to education to the environment and climate where racism actually had this hidden cost. And we hadn't fully tallied the ways that systemic racism and the zero sum idea that there's sort of a fixed pie of well-being. And if I get a bigger slice, you have to get a smaller slice. This idea of the zero-sum racial hierarchy was actually holding us back from doing things that in our collective self-interest. So I learned all of that over the course of three years, and I wrote it all down in a book that um, you know is some 400 pages with about 130 pages of notes at the end. Um, some people ask me why there are so many notes, and I realize that it's my my little bit of imposter syndrome, right? It's my little bit of like, I have to prove every single point that I assert in this book. And, you know, the book is really about bringing more evidence to something hidden that's been holding us back. It includes stories and people, but it really is building a case. And what I want to talk about tonight is something that I don't usually get to talk about, which is an invitation um, to talk about the values, right? the values behind so many of the stories and the revelations that came to me from the hundreds of people that I met and talked to from all walks of life on the course of that journey. And specifically, a really important value that I think people with backgrounds in economics and law like mine often discount. And that's the value of friendship. So I wanna tell you a few stories this evening about some friendships. Some friendships that were made and broken, that were forged, that became powerful, um, and that were all cross-racial friendships. So, does that sound good? Okay, great. Is that what you expected? Maybe not? All right. Um, all right. 
So the first friendship that I want to talk to you about this evening is a friendship between a, a little girl named Gail and a little girl whose name we don't recall. Um, but let's call her Anne for the sake of this evening. So Gail grew up in Cleveland, uh, on the black side of Cleveland, Ohio, and she was a quiet bush, bookish girl. She actually had, um, congenital, um, birth defect, uh, congenital glaucoma, which meant that she had multiple surgeries, uh, on her eyes before she was even five years old. And she was legally blind for much of her childhood. But she was a gifted, brilliant girl. And she was, she loved the theater. And so as her sight got better, um, she was able to get involved in the arts. And she auditioned for a summer program that was put on by a Cleveland-based playhouse that took children from different neighborhoods in Cleveland to this idyllic place in upstate New York. She did that audition and she won. And so she, this little girl from the black neighborhood in Cleveland, spent this unbelievable summer in Chautauqua, New York. And some of you may know about the Chautauqua Institution, um, an incredible storied community of people who love learning. It's, it's a lecture community. It's a residential lecture community. It's like a, an NPR theme park. <laughs> and it's been going on for, I don't know, maybe like 150 years. I mean, it's really a part of you know the beautiful, varied part of American history. And it is, um, the, the space itself is this sort of, this cluster of Victorian homes. So it really was like as different from her life as, as you could imagine. And the entire days were spent in arts and pottery and lectures. And it was just like this incredible life expanding experience for young Gail. She was a teenager. And she had a roommate, Anne. And Anne was her roommate in a yellow Victorian house. And Anne um, was from the other side of Cleveland, the white side of Cleveland. And Anne also had never experienced anything like Chautauqua and had never experienced anyone like Gail, had never lived with, known, cared for, exchanged more than a few words with Gail, someone like Gail, a black girl. This was in 1964, I think, or 1965. And so they spent the summer doing what little girls do, you know, talking in the bunk beds and whispering and walking to class together. And uh, as the summer was beginning to wind down, you know, a sadness came over everyone, right? That end of summer sadness. We'll never have this experience again. But for Anne, it was a deeper sadness because she knew she had to go home to her family, to her dad, to the life that she had lived and the stories she had been told about black people. And Anne, who was white, had um, a father who was a Cleveland police officer and who was very racist. And he had taught her that there was something very wrong with black people. And so as Anne was contemplating going back home at the end of the summer, the idea that she would have to go home with this friendship in her heart into a home with that much hate was irreconcilable for her. And so one day in the last week of camp, when Gail came home to the, um, their, their little Victorian house, Anne was being brought out on a stretcher because Anne had attempted suicide. And she'd left a note for Gail explaining who her father was and what he had taught her and how impossible it was for her to go home to that. Now, you know, this is the mid 1960s and whenever things like this happened then and, and sometimes now there's just sort of a shroud of secrecy and no adults really talk to the kids about what happened. There's no sense of kind of accountability or it all just sort of was a mess of emotions for young Gail. And so Gail never learned what happened to Anne. Nobody told her what happened to Anne. 
And to this day, she does not know whether she survived the suicide attempt, what happened. Young Gail grew up to be Gail Christopher, who's my mother. And when I first heard my mom tell me that story of her summer in Chautauqua, I was, as you were, shocked and moved. And it also made me think about how that formative experience taught some things to my mom and shaped the person that she would become. So it taught her that racism can kill, which she knew, right, being a black girl in America. But it taught her that racism is a poison that can be consumed by its concoctors. She taught, it taught her that the lie of racism attempts to sever our human connections. It attempts to tell us that we are not part of the same human family, that we can't love one another, that some groups of people are inherently better than others, and that dealing with the moral weight of that lie can be crushing to the people who are set up to benefit from it. My mother has had her own amazing journey, um, but in huge pieces of her life, she has dedicated herself to cross-racial understanding. She created a curriculum um, in the 1980s, a multicultural education curriculum, and would go across the country training public school teachers in a program that really told us about all the different peoples who contributed to this country. And then in her last 10 years in philanthropy, where she ended, um, well, I would say she ended her career, but she retired and now she runs a nonprofit, so. Um, <laughs> but um, she worked at the Kellogg Foundation and created the framework for communities to be able to do something that she calls truth, racial healing, and transformation, which is basically the idea that a country like ours needs a truth and reconciliation type of commission. We need to tell the truth. But it is not in order to reconcile, because that suggests that we were already together. Right? We are a nation that was founded on a belief, the false belief in a hierarchy of human value. And so we don't need to come back to that place. We need to transform. And that we need to heal. And that focus on healing, obviously, there's so many different parts of my mother's story that make that so resonant, including her own disability throughout her life. But also, I think that first friendship that she lost because of the sickness that is racism. Dozens of communities across the country and college campuses have adopted the TRHT framework, and people's lives have been transformed. Laws have been changed. And I think about Anne whoever, wherever she is on this plane or the next. And the way that her friendship that summer with my mom and what she was willing to sacrifice for it has had this resonance throughout time. The next story that I want to tell you is about, uh, also about a child. It's about a little boy named Tommy Cummings. Now, Tommy Cummings was also uh, a little black boy uh, in Baltimore uh, about a decade and a half earlier. And he was just an average black kid in Baltimore, Maryland. And it was the summer of 1953. And he had a group of friends, his little crew. And amazingly, his group of friends was four kids, two black and two white. And this was before everybody had air conditioning. It was a hot, sweltering, swampy, eastern seaboard summer. And like everybody then, in the sort of golden era of big public swimming pools, Tommy and his friends wanted to swim. But they wanted to swim together. And there was no big 
grand resort style public swimming pool, the kinds of which we used to have nearly 2000 in this country, often created as part of the New Deal boom of public goods, roads, bridges, libraries, schools, parks, and these pools. Baltimore had plenty of those kinds of pools, but they were all segregated. And so there was no public pool in Baltimore where Tommy and his friends could swim together. And so they had to take to natural waters. And they went swimming in the Patapsco River in those rough waters. And Tommy got caught in an undertow and he drowned. The NAACP sued the city in the memory of Tommy Cummings that summer arguing that black families' tax dollars had helped to build the public pools, and so they should have free access to all of them, that there should be no black and white swimming pools. And in Tommy's memory, they won. They prevailed, and a federal court issued a desegregation decree for the city of Baltimore, saying there shall be no more black and white pools. All public pools shall be for all of the public. That story in Baltimore happened all across the country in that era, in the mid-1950s, as towns and cities across the country really experiencing the, the wave of freedom fighting of the civil rights movement began to face desegregation orders from courts, advocacy, swim-ins, protests, boycotts. There was something about those public swimming pools that just seemed like the next front for integration. And so as these desegregation decrees came down across the country, towns and cities faced a choice. And many of them decided to drain their public pools rather than integrate them. Now, oftentimes when I tell that story about the drained pools, people assume that it happened in the Jim Crow South. And it did, right? We, Montgomery, Alabama, I walked the grounds of this huge flat expanse in this beautiful Law Olmsted public park called Oak Park, where there used to be one of the biggest pools in the South called Oak Park Pool. And that was drained in Montgomery. They closed the entire Parks and Recreation Department of the city starting in 1959 in order to not comply with the federal court order. And they kept the city's Parks and Recreation Department closed for a decade rather than integrated. We were in 1970 before Montgomery had a Parks and Recreation Department. And even when they reopened the department, they never rebuilt the pool. So that happened in Montgomery, Alabama. Makes sense. It happened in California, in New Jersey, in Washington State, in Ohio. The more I talk about this book across the country, the more people come up to me and tell me that they remember watching the gravel get poured into the pool. That they remember that there used to be a beautiful pool for their older brother, but it was gone by the time they were old enough to swim. All across the country, whether it was in a big court decree moment, there one day and gone the next, or it was just suddenly the pool fell into disrepair and the city stopped investing in it and it was closed. In many towns and cities across the country, faced with desegregation orders, the, the towns decided to sell their public pools to a private entity, oftentimes it was the YMCA, for a dollar, so that the private entity could then decide which members would be accepted. One of the strangest moments in the book tour that I have had has been when I got a call from Backyard Swim and Spa, I think it was called, a trade magazine for the backyard pool industry because they were doing a racial reckoning about the advent of their industry when the backyard pool became de rigueur for the average middle class family and it was in the wake of public pool integration. What once was a public good, and not just a public good, 
like a nice thing to have, but also a place where people would meet and fall in love, where friendships would be formed because there was a vibrant public space. The people who created the sort of paradigm of these kinds of social infrastructure understood what they were doing. It was part of the idea of Americanization of ethnic whites, right? It was the idea that if we could meet together in common space, if we could recreate together, we could create a new people together. But there was a limit to that vision of who should be friends, who should splash around in the pool together, who should fall in love at the water's edge. That limit was the color line. Tommy Cummings gave his life just trying to swim with his friends. So when I think about the legacy of the drained public pools, I think about, yes, the economic aspect of it, right? And for me, drained pool politics is a metaphor to help describe what's happened to our economy as we radically shifted from a New Deal economic paradigm that had a series of laws in tax policy, trade policy, labor policy that helped to create the greatest middle class the world had ever seen, that together recognized that the government had a right and a responsibility to ensure a decent standard of living for people. It was born out of the crucible of the Great Depression, this sort of ethos of public goods in the New Deal. And it helped to create an economy that kind of looked like a football, right, with a fat middle class and narrower ends of low and high income households. But then we shifted. We shifted our economic paradigm to one that created what I call the inequality era, accelerating in the 1970s and 80s to where we now have an economy that looks more like a bow tie, right? With a squeezed middle class and bulging ends of low and high income households. And I know as someone who worked in economic policy, what were the decisions in tax policy, in trade policy, in collective bargaining and minimum wage, in our public goods and investments, in the kind of expectation that people had about what kinds of things we would do together. I understood all that. But what I didn't understand was why. Why would our country turn its back on the formula that had created the American dream? And what I learned in the course of my journey, of course, is that drained pool politics had so much to do with it that the idea of collective action, of an expectation that we would have common problems and seek out common solutions for them, that we would expect that the vehicle we use to do things together, namely the government, would have a significant role in addressing what was wrong in society and making a foundation for independent innovation and ingenuity and private enterprise, but would create sort of a floor that expectation suddenly disappeared when we all had to swim in the same pool. So that economic story of what the impacts were of drained pool politics is something that I learned over the course of my journey. But tonight, I've been just very reflective and in preparation for this evening, about the interpersonal aspect of the drained pools, about what was lost in our communities when we stopped investing in the public goods, in those social infrastructure pieces that helped to create a sense of who we are to one another in neighborhoods and communities. Now, when I talk about my book with young people, um, the thing that they most pay attention to is, well, when I talk about drain pool politics and higher education funding and student debt, that's definitely one thing. <laughs> definitely one thing they're very interested in. But the other thing is the way in which they have inherited a still stubbornly segregated society 
where their parents and the media and leaders don't explain to them why we are so segregated. And they don't understand. They, they sort of see it as, well, it's just as an aggregation of individual choices. They don't really know, as I frankly did not know before I set out on the journey to write this book, the degree to which it was government that mandated segregation across the country. When I think about the public goods that helped to create the foundation of the American middle class and also the built environment in which we live, you can tell that story in every single aspect of it is a racial exclusion that still bears fruit to this day. We can tell the story of the New Deal and we can talk about the ways in which things like Social Security for the elderly help to almost eliminate elder poverty, make sure that no one had to work until they died. And yet, it excluded the two job categories that most black workers were in, domestic work and agricultural work, in a concession to the Southern delegation of Congress. You can talk about the massive investment in housing that created the suburbs and, and the, the home infrastructure, the 30-year mortgage, mortgage insurance, all of that, that really made the sort of home ownership foundation for the American dream. And talk at the same breath, in the same breath about how the same New Deal federal government that wanted to revive home ownership and in fact create a, a heretofore really unprecedented public policy model that said that a working class family could pay a little bit over time and own an asset that would appreciate over generations. Right? It's really unprecedented, the idea of mass home ownership and the community building that it created. And yet, based all of that poly on the never substantiated assumption that black people would be too much of a credit risk. And so drew maps of all the biggest areas of the country and color coded them to the block level by their racial and ethnic character. And the areas with a high Negro concentration were marked red, grade D, do not lend, forbidding private investment in these areas. So much of our country's built environment, which of course is how we experience life, right? The homes we grow up in, the neighborhoods, the shapes of our communities, has been marked by the legacy of this enforced segregation. I always wondered, maybe you did too, why it is that our residential suburbs kind of all look the same and the houses all kind of look the same, right? 75% or more of most of the metro areas, the biggest metro areas in our country still have the kinds of restrictive zoning laws that require a certain house type and size. These came in a rash when the Supreme Court knocked down the idea that a city could just say no people of color can live here. And so instead, what cities began to do in towns is outlaw the kinds of housing that most working class and middle class black and brown families could afford. We take for granted today that we just don't have enough housing supply and land is expensive. And you can't have a working class family living in a middle class neighborhood. But that is also part of what racism wrote into our housing codes and the way we live today. And it shows up in the kinds of friendships that we can have, who we go to school with, who we fall in love with, who we see as being in our neighborhood and in our community and in our circle of human concern. And that is a fundamental flaw in this country that is the greatest experiment in multiracial democracy. And we've got to fix it. Because when we do allow breakthroughs, breakthroughs of cross-racial connection, Miraculous things happen. 
So the last story I want to tell you is about a friendship that changed the law. No, I'm not going to talk about loving v. Virginia, <laughs> which would be great, which is also a great example. I'm talking about a story you might not have heard. This is a story of a white guy named Neil, who was from Ohio, got the politics bug uh, when he was in college, he was a conservative Republican, got the opportunity to work for some campaigns, and then became a House staffer for the United States Congress huge, was really good at it, and was so good at it that he started sort of hanging out with the fast-talking circles of people in Congress, with the insiders, with the lobbyists, and he got more and more ambitious. And he ended up taking a job in the revolving door of Congress with a big lobbying firm. And he realized that he and his lobbying firm were cutting some corners. But he was making more money than he ever thought possible. And he was having so much influence. Now, Neil's boss was Jack Abramoff. So some people in this room remember that. It was the biggest lobbying scandal since Watergate. Some people don't. But it was a big deal. And so Jack Abramoff was running these schemes, these kickback schemes, fully, fully corrupt. And it ended up coming down on Neil's head and many other people who worked for Abramoff. And Neil decided to cooperate, became one of the you know, front page Washington Post witnesses um, in this prosecution and himself um, pled to a felony of corruption. So this was a low time for Neil. Neil lost everything. He used to be like the man about town and now people wouldn't answer his calls. They wouldn't, they'd cross the street when they saw him. His marriage fell apart and he moved to Florida. And he moved to Florida and he tried to get a job and start over. He started uh, volunteering with, uh, in a homeless shelter, mainly so the judge would think he was a better guy. But then he realized that he loved the work. And there was something about it that really fed him on a really fundamental level. He got to Florida and he realized it was very hard to get a job with a felony conviction. So he ended up, this college educated, formerly one of the you know, top 100 people, most powerful people in Washington, he ended up uh, being a janitor at a restaurant, a night janitor at a restaurant. And by day, he would volunteer at a homeless shelter. And that was his life for years. He became so involved in uh, the unhoused community and advocacy that he found himself one day at a community college at a meeting you know, an advocacy meeting around those issues. And across the hall, he saw a flyer and heard the booming voice of somebody who was talking about the issue of felony disenfranchisement. Florida had a lifetime ban on people with felony convictions uh, ever voting again. So he was like, well, that's me. So he kind of went across the hall and stood in the back and the guy at the head of the room was this big, booming-voiced preacher-orator guy named Desmond. And the whole room was mostly black folks. And he was like, this is definitely like a progressive -y room. These are not my people. But he heard Desmond talk about the value of second chances and redemption and love. And he stayed. And then afterwards, he went up to the front of the room and talked to Desmond and his wife, Sheena, and they talked for hours. They went and got dinner together. They just couldn't stop talking to each other. It turned out they had so much to talk about. This Republican, disgraced lobbyist, and this black civil rights leader Desmond, who it turns out had been a military man who'd fallen into drugs in the military and had been an addict for much of his adult life, had ended up homelessness in and out of jail, 
one day stood on the train tracks thinking he would end his life. Desmond did not end his life that day. He walked two more blocks into rehab and checked himself in. When he came out, he ended up putting himself through school, graduating at the top of his class, volunteering all the while with homeless communities, and found himself deeply passionate about the idea that we should overturn this lifetime ban on people with felony convictions. Was a volunteer for the coalition, and then they said, you should be the executive director of it. So that's what brought Desmond to that room that night. Desmond and Neil became friends, like mother, brother from another mother type of friends, finish each other's sentences type of friends. And together, they hatched an audacious plan to take this issue of what would need to be a constitutional amendment to the Florida State Constitution directly to the voters for a ballot initiative known as Amendment 4. You would need a supermajority in order to make this constitutional amendment. And as we know, Florida is not a wholly democratic state. <laughs> and as we know, civil rights, voting rights, this law which was made as part of the Jim Crow backlash to create a series of felonies that could be arbitrarily given to black men to suppress black men's voting uh, after uh, the Civil War. There's no reason that a man like Neil and the people who voted like him and went to church like him and listened to music like him would necessarily see themselves in the coalition for this change. And yet, as I got to know Desmond and Neil, what I saw in their friendship, in their way of seeing the world, which sort of overlapped like this Venn diagram, right? like this iris in the middle of an eye, very different people. And yet they connected on the values that they shared of redemption, of love, as they would both say, have you or anyone you loved ever made a mistake? And does that make you or them any less worthy of a voice, any less human. They connected on that and somehow were then able to create a strategy that was big enough and values led enough to create an overwhelming bipartisan majority to win Amendment 4 at the ballot. Uprooting as Desmond would say, one of the last legal vestiges of Jim Crow on the books in the state of Florida. I do not think, and Desmond would say this as well, that without that friendship, Desmond would have had the confidence to be able to go wherever the votes were, to the Trump rallies, to the evangelical churches and know in his heart that anyone could see the world through that shared core vision. I believe that the power of friendship is a secret superpower. I believe we have an opportunity in this country, the most diverse, advanced democracy, which will soon become a country with no racial majority, where there is someone here with a tie to every single community on the globe. I believe that all of the trauma, the near genocide, the stolen people, the stolen land, the stolen labor, the economic exploitation, all of that that created this land of ancestral strangers that brought somebody from every community here could possibly be the way that this country redeems itself. Because perhaps 
rather than seeing the collision of peoples as some sort of grand competitive landscape for us to figure out who's on top. Perhaps the proximity of so much human difference will help reveal our common humanity. And it's not rocket science how that's going to happen, how a multiracial democracy that is egalitarian, that rejects the zero-sum racial hierarchy is going to happen. It's going to happen because people will see themselves in one another, will say, I am not you. Your problems are not entirely the same as my problems. Your hopes and your dreams, however, probably are. And I am willing to recognize that the most important things that happen in life, we can't do on our own. And increasingly, with the cascading crises of this age, from inequality to climate change to the threats of global war, none of those problems can be solved at the individual level. And in a multiracial society, they all have to be solved by us coming together, listening to one another, dare I say loving one another, enough to truly see each other, to reject now and forever, the lie of the false belief in a hierarchy of human value. To be willing to live our lives in conjunction and not apart. That, I think, is going to be the secret. Our young people, bless them, they are so, so many of them already there. They want us to get out of the way. They want us to uproot the vestiges in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our laws, in our economy that are holding back their unbounded human potential for love and connection. That's our charge, to love them as we do love our children, enough to let them love other children. It's the least we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think yours has a low battery because it's blinking green and red, maybe? I'll, I'll just stand up here. Okay, cool. Okay. That was incredible. Uh, I don't know if you all noticed that. Some of you in the back may not have noticed that, that Heather did that all without any notes, without any script. That, that is a superpower. Uh, um, we have time for Q&A from the audience. We have microphones here at the right and the left, or the right and the left for you. And um, if you want to come down and line up, um, Heather is gracious enough to take some uh, audience questions. Um, while, while you come down and do that, I just want to say, uh, wow, Heather, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Heather got the memo that this is, I mean, her book has a lot of economic um, and policy stuff. This was very much a humanities lecture. I love that you talked about values. I, I think that there's this, there's this kind of stereotype out there that humanists and anti-racists in particular are about deconstructing histories of oppression and um, calling out people and criticizing behaviors that are um, oppressive and policies that are oppressive. And, and of course, we do, we do that. <laughs> um, but I think it's a, it's a misconception that we are not animated by values. And I think there's a, a party in this country that has uh, perpetuated a certain idea that they are the, they are the party of family values. And, and I mean, that you talked about values of friendship, of love, of community, of equality, of generosity, of forgiveness. 
Um, those are the values that animate politics. There are politics that are about those, those lived experiences. I also want to just say, as a, I'm a literature professor when I'm not um, acting director of the Humanities Center, and um, I, I told Heather when, when uh, I first met her that she's just an incredible storyteller and what a cogent and, and beautiful and eloquent speaker. Um, Thank you. She, she knows how to do the thing that I tell my students that really writing is about, which is can you take a complicated idea and explain it to someone else and convey your idea to them that don't already share, share that in and, and a compelling way. And so your storytelling, your uh, use of metaphor or a resonant image, it's, it's just incredible. So thank you for uh, showing us all these great hum uh, humanist skills. OK, um, we'll take our first question from this side, please. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'll just hold it. OK. <laughs> First of all, um, my name is Darlene McDonald. Hi. And I want to just say, oh. <laughs> thank you. I just want to say, well, among other things, thank you very much for writing this book. I immediately after I read this book, I purchased 30 copies. <laughs> oh, so you're the one. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and took them to our state school board. Mm. And gave them to the entire school yes. board. <laughs> Thank you. I I feel like it should be required reading. Thank you. And so I, I want to say thank you very much for for writing it. But my question is, your thoughts on the governor of Virginia, uh, Governor Youngkin, mm -hmm. came out um, I, I believe yesterday as wanting to ban. Mm -hmm. Um, K through five teachings of Martin Luther King mm -hmm. and others, if you have any thought to that at all. Um, well, thank you. Um, so in February, the young readers version of The Some of Us comes out. And I am so excited about this. I mean, yeah. In some ways, like I'd rather have a young reader's version than an adult version if I had to choose, right? Um, so it's for you know junior high, middle grade students. So please go back to your school board with that. Um, so in the paperback version of the book, uh, which my editor forced me to do an afterward, and I couldn't believe it. I was like, I just finished writing this book. Uh, what do you? This is not a blog that gets like updated daily. Like, what do you? What do you? from me but it was because it was the summer of 2001 and I'd finished writing it in November 2020 and so January 6th hadn't happened um, the attacks on honest education in the country but also the solidarity dividends of you know everything that happened in the American Rescue Plan and the poverty rate going down to its low, lowest late rate on record in 2021, right? So there was actually a lot. But I spent a lot of time in the afterward talking about these attacks on education. I see them as A, not new. Um, I think the starting point to understand them is that, uh, as I write in the book, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center did a survey in 2018 and found that less than 10% of high school seniors could accurately say that slavery was the primary cause of the Civil War. So that's where we're starting from, right? So let's always remember that when we're like, oh, what are they teaching in schools these days? It's like not enough, you know? Um, I mean, I went to great schools, public and private, parochial. I just feel like I learned in history, like memorizing names of battles, right? Like what does that tell me about our society and, and, and how does that help me think critically about the world? And it wasn't thematic, it was like memorization. Um, and so that's where we're starting from. That's part of a whole ideology, a campaign uh, called the Lost Cause, right? Which was really a campaign to change history, to let the losers of the Civil War write history. And so the response to the racial consciousness raising of 2020, to the first African-American president, to our changing diversity, to the fact that our schools are now already across the country, you know, plurality to majority students of color has been another racial panic. But I think that it is fundamentally, like so much of 
the racist tactics, one that is motivated by greed, by the by the by people who are trying to get economic and political profit. Political profit, it's clear, right? They want to sort of scare suburban parents into a political affiliation. But it's also about making sure that young people do not have that cross-racial solidarity, empathy, and understanding that they know has been the backbone of every movement for justice, whether it's workers' rights or in the environment, right? They know that, that, that really understanding who we are and who we are to one another you know, we'll have them call out the emperor with no clothes about the self-interested elite. And so um, I, is that for me or for him? Okay. It's a little poppy. Hello. Ta-da. Thanks. I can't sing. Don't, don't get any ideas. Um, so I think they're overplaying their hand. 83% of American parents think that we should teach the good and bad parts of American history. Banning Martin Luther King. I mean, my son knows who Martin Luther King is. He's four. And that's really important. <laughs> I will just say one other thing about this. Um, this really is about following the money, right? This really is about um, partisan donors looking to break the back of public schools, right? Public schools, which are an integrated public good, which are you know tax dollars, which are a, a public pool, right? It's another drained pool strategy. Coming off the pandemic, there's a real ideology around privatizing public schools, around not having places where, you know, um, people meet, you know, from all walks of life. And I just, if, um, yeah, I mean, if a six-year-old girl can integrate a public school, <laughs> then a six-year-old kid can learn about the need to integrate public schools, right? Thank you. We'll, we'll take a question from over here. Squat a little bit. <laughs> that mic is I, not helping you, but yes, go ahead. <laughs> as long as I can go. Uh, so my initial question was going to be about how you kind of protect yourself in the, in the search for friendships with people who may not mm. see you as mm -hmm. people. And I, mm. and I try really hard to kind of do that in my personal life. And I've felt in those interactions that kind of level of uh, lack of safety in yeah. those interactions. Yeah. So, um, and I guess, you know, to tie it back to schools, right? We have these school board meetings where people are coming in and accusing teachers and members of the school board of being pedophiles, groomers, you know, these, these really intense and personal, uh, deeply personal attacks. So how do you protect yourself? Yeah, thank you for the question. So I think there's a couple of things going on there. You probably are not going to make friends with the people who think that you're a pedophile groomer. So I'm definitely not saying to go all the way to the end of the bridge, right? Um, but um, that person does have friends who might be a little closer to you, who might be a little less indoctrinated, right? Um, you know, ultimately, we are living in a time where the misinformation and deliberate disinformation is as powerful as it's been since the printing press. Right? There's more money behind it, more technological sophistication, and it's, it's a very dangerous time, clearly. Um, and it's, it is scary. I don't want to minimize it. Not at that extreme, but actually just like an easier one, which is like, you know, your neighbor, a person on the PTA, somebody who's not, you know, coming out with you with a lot of hate. It can be challenging to cross that divide. Um, and part of, I think, what has made those cross-racial friendships that I've seen throughout my life and, and with a real focus during my book and then the journey I took to do the podcast has been when there is a sense of shared purpose to start with that keeps you in it, that's about a connection that you have that's more than just your identity, your culture, what you listen to, right? It's your children. 
it's organizing your workplace, it's, you know, cleaning up the river that, you know, feeds past your farm. Um, it, it, it is, you do need that piece. And then from there, it takes grace all around. They will offend you, you will offend them. And like, it's okay, <laughs> right? It's okay. I mean, if I never smiled at, was friends with, hung out with anybody who ever offended me or thought something ignorant about me and my people, I would be a lonely person indeed. <laughs> I would not be married. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I think it's about that grace. I think it's about shared purpose. I don't think you have to go all the way. Um, and I do think that there should be protection for our school board members and our teachers. And everybody sitting on the sidelines and saying tisk tisk about this needs to be in those school board meetings standing up for them. Amen to that. That really, that one really gets me. The the teachers and librarians because they are out there. I know. They're the ones that care about our kids and work really hard for not a lot of money. Yeah. So, um, uh, yes, over here. Thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, everybody. I have a question. Uh, sorry, I saw a black woman. I'm I'm just every time I see black woman, I'm just so happy in Salt Lake City. Uh, <laughs> I, I have a question in terms of kind of reading off of that, of getting tired. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I can understand how it might benefit particularly white liberals to have this cross-racial friendship mm -hmm. where they can learn and be cool and be trendy and be hip and have this black mm -hmm. friend. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is the other side, which is being that friend. Mm -hmm always being the one that's they're like, well, why are black people upset about this? Why are, you know, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And how do you work yeah. on really not just getting sick and tired? And I say that as a, as a person in schools, and I see our students, as soon as they meet each other, boom, they're friends. Um, and they have lots of things in common and understanding. But I feel like as we've gotten older, or at least yeah. as I've gotten older, you learn more like, you know, I'm not trying to be your explanation for why racism exists in America. Yeah. yeah. So what do you do yeah. with being tired? So that's, that's very real. Um, well, I think one of the important parts of being a true friend is that they would not make you do that emotional labor. And that once you say that to them, that there are plenty of books, documentaries, fiction films, spoken word poetry, <laughs> podcasts, <laughs> what else? <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> um, and that that's an emotional boundary for you. And that's really important. That they should respect that. And they should be able to realize that you're not, it's, I mean, what often happens in these experiences is that it's like, well, I just asked her one question, right. you know? It's like, but you're the 20th person to ask that question. And I just wanted to talk about knitting tonight <laughs> or whatever it is. So I think an authentic relationship allows for that. And, 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 and that's really important. And that's really important to say kind of early on in a friendship, right? Um, and then just sort of like the larger question you asked, you, you made the, the point that you can see the value for white people in having a diverse circle of friendships. So what's the value for people of color in having white people in your friend group? Um, I'm gonna make like so many jokes, but I'm not going to. <laughs> um, For me, it has, there have been moments when it has truly helped me stay hopeful. Because, you know, I mean, the thing about the zero sum is that you, people who want to see racial justice in society can get caught 
in actually saying the zero sum themselves and believing the zero sum themselves, right? If we think racism is so great for white people, it creates all of these benefits and privileges, and therefore it's like bad for people of color and good for white people, it, it sort of reifies this idea that we are not connected. And of course, racism has like a million benefits, material, psychological, et cetera, political for white people. And yet it also has these costs. And the world that we are trying to see to make is one not in which white people have less health care and less good schools and have more contact with the police, right? <laughs> That's not what we want. We don't want those privileges to go away because we want them to have worse lives. We want those privileges to go away because we want everyone to have those things and then they wouldn't be privileges, right? And so her, the temptation that I think has been very real to get a little bit hard hearted in these moments of enduring and in fact increasing sort of mainstreaming of, of racist beliefs and ideas and stories, um, ultimately I think is not the heart that can be in it for the long haul, right? That's not John Lewis's heart, right? Who forgave the man who beat him on the bridge. And that wasn't for the man's benefit, that was for John Lewis's benefit, to be able to stay in it and believe in the promised land of the brotherhood of man. So I think that those relationships where they're, where they're authentic and they've had moments of like, this is not gonna work for me unless, and like, you know, those relationships remind us a little bit of the promised land. And so we need them too. We, we may have time for just one more question. <laughs> no pressure. Okay. That's a lot of pressure. I hope it's good. <laughs> um, just, um, I have two questions. One, are you going to make more podcast episodes? <laughs> mm -hmm. What's your second question? <laughs> <laughs> and my second question is about school. I found your book. Um, I am a, I have a graduate degree in education. I taught school. I don't teach traditional school now. Um, and I have attended lots of school board meetings because um, we're doing, we're closing schools. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking because the schools um, that are closing are in low income areas. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, and I've, I've seen how we're villainizing the school district because they're closing the schools and it is sad. It is not, I'm not saying it's not sad that we are making refugees or low income families or immigrants to this country like get on a bus to travel to a different school. But it's, it's more of a symptom of the fact that in Utah we have a very open, open enrollment policy. It's extremely flexible. Um, basically, if there is room at the school that you want to go to, you can go there. Mm -hmm. And we love education choice in the state of Utah. Um, and I, I, as I attend these meetings and have these conversations, and I'm, I, I write my representative, and I am happy to write local newspapers and editors and yeah. editorials, but I, and I will vomit information to anybody who wants <laughs> to ask me about this, but I don't know how to really impact change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for what you do. It's more than most. Thank you. Um, the first one was very easy to answer. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, she's referring to the podcast of The Some of Us, which is um, available now on wherever podcasts are streamed. I went back out on the road. Each one is a hopeful story of cross-racial organizing all across the country. The closest one to here is probably in rural Nevada, an extraordinary story about an anti-indigenous sundown siren that still blares every day. It's just, it's, it was an amazing experience. Um, and um, we just recently released an action guide um, for people who get excited about the podcast or the book and want to figure out how they can become more active in their communities. It's on the someofuspodcast.com. I'm not going to do more of that. 
because it was so amazing and so hard and I had no idea what I was getting into. I didn't know that I was gonna make like eight documentaries and it was just a lot and I, and I have to do other things. Uh, but I'm so, I cherish that podcast. I might do an easier podcast like where I have somebody on and I talk to them. I think like that's what you're supposed to do with podcasts, right? Not supposed to be like trudging in the snow and like you know, excuse me, ma'am, will you talk? No, you know what I mean. Like that, that, that I'm not going to do again, not for a minute. <sighs> you know what you're frustrated about? I mean, there's so many things to say about it, but ultimately, um, what you're frustrated about is a real failure of collective action. Right, so the paradigm that you're referring to is one where it's like each family gets to just find the best thing they can find, right? But it's not saying let's make it so there's a great public school in every neighborhood. And that's what's so devastating um, because it's not about just a race to the top. It's about making sure that every neighborhood has a decent place where the people of that neighborhood get something great that's well resourced no matter how much their you know property values are and i think when we really see the legacy of explicit racism in our property values it becomes even more unconscionable to tie how much we fund and resource our children's schools based on local property values right so thank you. Thank you. Before, before I let you all thank Heather again, um, I just want to remind you that the King's English will be selling books. Please buy a book. Heather will be signing books outside. And I want to let you know that the Tanner Humanities Center has an incredible slate of spring lectures. Please visit thc.utah.edu. Follow us on social. And please join me in thanking Heather McGee. <laughs>